Um, well, welcome. It's lovely to see so many of you. I'm Mary Denya. I'm the head of scholarships for um, Marshall. And um, well, you know, what a strange time we're in. Normally I'd be in an office in London and instead I'm in my bedroom in Surrey. Uh, I've met some of you. Uh, Helen is also here. So Helen, if you take your mute off and just say hello as well. Hi, I'm Helen. Uh, I'm the program, admin program administrator. So um, I probably emailed all of you at some point. In fact, I definitely have. Um, but yeah, looking forward to meeting you in person when we can. So first of all, I want to say thank you so much to all of you for your patience in this very difficult period of time. I know it's there's been a lot of uncertainty and sometimes I've not been able to tell you more than I know. And, um, you know, that has meant that there have been some times where I've not really been able to tell you what's going on because, frankly, we haven't known what's going on. Um, and we are finally getting a much clearer picture of the new year. And I'm really excited that you are all going to be able to come in September and some of you in October and a few of you in August. Um, and uh, um, we will be able to welcome you here. And hopefully, well, I know that you'll have an amazing time. It won't be the same perhaps as previous years, but um, I hope that as the year progresses, uh, things will change and things will get better and you'll be able to do more but it looks like the universities are really going to be doing a lot of work to support everybody and we're going to do as much as we can and we'll continue to do virtual events orientation will be virtual um, and um, when I know what that looks like I'll let you know too uh, but at the moment we are focusing on getting you all here which is the first stage of everything that's going to go on so today I'm just going to give you an overview of our plans or of the plans that we know um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about making sure that you're all communicating with us that we're your first port of call for questions and um, sort of just talk through some of the things and why we give advice for various things and then um, we will Helen and I will take questions we will try and answer as many questions as possible um, and I know that some of you may not may have lots of questions and we can always take them offline and well They'll be all online but offline through email or you know If you feel that you want a conversation directly with myself or Helen, we can also arrange that as well so Firstly, so as of today, I have organized more or less settled your scholar circles um, Helen and I had a discussion about what we were going to call them. They were kind of called Marshall um, Cambridge Plus and Oxford Humanities and all kinds of different things. So we're going, we've decided to name these circles after British castles and palaces um, because why not? Um, so I think I've tried to change, I've tried to choose ones that you'll be able to pronounce because some of them you may not be able to pronounce. Um, and, and to be honest, it is just a silly thing, so you don't need to worry too much about it. But maybe your group could be challenged to go and visit said palace when you're able to, so that could be a, a challenge for you. But basically what we've done is, on the whole, the groups have been arranged around um, where you're studying. In some cases, they're arranged around what you're studying. Um, and um, in some cases, it's around your arrival date. So we're trying to create you a circle of scholars who will be um, the people that you will be most in contact with. Now, that's not to say that you won't be talking to everybody else, and I'm sure you will be, but we just wanted to try and set up some kind of circle that gives you some extra support. And with that will also come, we're going to be assigning a member of the alumni to that and we'll also be assigning um, various other people, including perhaps a commissioner as well. So it just allows us to deal with you in smaller groups, uh, whereas normally we'd be sticking you all on one plane to the UK. Obviously, we're not going to be doing that this year, sadly. Um, and also, um, sadly, I'm not able to come and meet you all at the airport because the risks to my health would be uh, fairly significant. So, well, actually, maybe not, but standing around in an airport for hours on end for multiple days would not really work but we will be making sure that you are met at the airport whether that be by taxis in some cases some of the universities are actually doing airport pickups themselves and so we'll be arranging those as well 
Um, we have a travel agent in the US. In fact, you've all dealt with her before because when you went to your interviews, you had to book flights. Well, maybe some of you didn't book flights, but most of you would have booked flights. So Laurie, who you dealt with to book your flights to that. And um, we are just about finalizing um, what we think will be your arrival dates. And so I hope that I will be able to share your arrival dates with you beginning of next week. The reason we are humming and hurrying about it is because we need to make sure that the university dates aren't changing, that um, quarantine is, you know, how quarantine is going to work and all of those things. So we're going to be doing all of that. I'll let you know who is in your circle as well. And some of the fun things that we'll be doing is orientation. That will also be your team for whatever we do. We're kind of looking at all kinds of things, possibly a virtual escape room, maybe an afternoon tea, who knows? We'll do all kinds of different things. Um, and, and I'm, you know, there will be still the formal part of the program and where um, we would have done visits and things like, you know, we do the, usually do the London Eye, we visit the um, House of the Parliament. Where we have done those in the past, we will attempt, if allowable and able to, to do that later in the year so that you don't miss out on those opportunities. We do still want you to be able to do those. Um, and so we will try and do those as separate events later in the year. It is possible, depending on what's going on in the UK, um, that we will be able to bring you all together at Thanksgiving, fingers crossed. But as you all know, we are all living one day at a time. So, but that's, that's something that's in our minds to be able to do as well. So, but obviously for us, your health and safety and your well-being is the most important thing. So we're trying to make sure that we arrange it so that everybody has support, uh, a group that can support them, us and all kinds of other things. One of the other things that we um, we have a program called Marshall Connect, uh, which started last year and is um, a program where we match each of our scholars with a member of the civil service fast stream in the UK. So they're the people they in the UK, the civil service are the government um, support. They're the people who have um, entered this a program to become leaders of our civil service in the UK and they work in all kinds of different departments and they come from different places and all kinds of interesting things but the great thing is that the, almost all of them if not all of them are British so we will be pairing you with somebody who's British so um, that's somebody else you can talk to about the oddities of the culture and <laughs> the UK and um, we hope that, that will, we will be able to get that sorted. Uh, the whole application process there end is starting, has just started. So we expect to be able to get that matching done towards the end of August. And I'll be sending you some information about what we need from you in order to do the matches. We hope that we'll be able to in some way involve you in the matches as well. Um, but at the moment, we are just in that first stage. But again, so that will be another set of people, hopefully that you will be able to ask random questions to about what the hell's going on because sometimes you know our culture is very different and sometimes you have to try and work out what's going on um the other thing that i would say is that um we have arranged for all of you to speak to a representative from the university that you're attending that way they will be able to tell you about all the support networks, anything from mental health to banking accounts and all those sorts of things. And they'll be able to talk to you about what's in place for the universities because in, in the end, the universities are the place that you, that's where you're going. That's where most of your support will come from. And so we've arranged it and all of them, all of the universities have agreed to do present, to do conversations and talk to you personally on top of all the webinars and everything else that they're already offering. So please do make sure that you go to those webinars and anything that they're offering, because I think it's a really important way of learning about your university and what they offer. But we are, have also arranged to do that. And again, that will probably be towards the end of August. Um, as far as um, things like housing go, I know that some of you have heard from Helen about housing. I'll let her talk about it a little bit. But what I am going to say to you is that I realise that you've all been talking to current scholars and the current scholars are telling you all kinds of things. First of all, Helen and I are the professionals that run this scholarship. We're the people that know what's going on, how it works, 
we're British, we understand all kinds of other things. So please do talk to us. I'm not saying you shouldn't talk to the current scholars because of course they're a really useful tool. But when it comes to learning, wanting to know about Marshall and the realities of Marshall and what the rules are and all the other things, you should be talking to us as well and letting us know if you have questions. As far as accommodation goes, as you know, we usually recommend that scholars try and live in halls of residence if they can. I know that many of you are quite keen to live privately. If you decide to do that, you know, that is your choice, but you need to be aware of several things. Firstly, you will need to quarantine when you arrive in the UK for 14 days. You, we do not, in fact, I would avidly say, do not sign up for things if you haven't seen them. You can't sign up for private accommodation, accommodation that isn't without going and seeing it because you're signing up to a year long contract. And if it's not what it looks like in the pictures, you won't be able to get out of the lease. So just please, if you do decide you want to live privately, you need to think about what you're going to do, how you're going to arrange temporary accommodation during that period. Universities are all supporting quarantine. That means that they're delivering groceries, they're making sure people have food, all of those things. If you decide to leave privately, that support is simply not there. Um, obviously, we can help you sign up to grocery, grocery orders, ordering services. They are far more advanced than they are in the US, or weirdly, I don't know why, but in the UK, getting, getting your groceries delivered is a very easy thing, um, and it isn't just Whole Foods, so <laughs> slightly cheaper as well. But um, just be aware that there are differences around um, the sort of private residencies, if there were to be another lockdown and you decided to return to the US, most of the universities have reimbursed um, rent. They won't do that if you're living privately. So you just need to be aware of those pros and cons. Again, I am not saying you have to live in halls. You know, I understand that for some people, halls is not where they want to go. But we, if you do want that backup or if you do think you might want to live in halls, then please get your applications through Helen in. And Helen, maybe that's where you jump in and tell say. Um, yeah, so uh, I agree with Mary that um, we do strongly recommend that you consider living in halls um, and we do every year, but it is especially important this year. Um, if you are applying for university managed accommodation, we ask that you do it through us so that we can keep track of it. Um, we will pay deposits if they're required. Um, so that, that makes it much easier for you. You don't have to do any international transfers um, for, for, you know, to universities. Um, it just helps us understand when when you can move in and when you can arrive and, and we have really good relationships with a lot of the colleges and universities and we can often arrange for people to arrive earlier than the contract start date um, so so that's another positive um, I'm not sure what much else I've got to add I, I can understand the attraction of of, of living privately um, and you know I, I can you can think well I don't want to just be stuck in halls but I mean halls have got so many benefits and you'll be with other other students international and British um, and you'll have sort of like a little immediate circle um, of people to hang out with which when there's not as many opportunities perhaps as normal to meet other people um, could be a real plus. So again this is not us saying you can't live privately and I know some of you have already arranged to do that and that's absolutely fine but we're just saying, you know, you do need to make sure that if you have decided to live privately, you need to make sure that you've got temporary accommodation that you can stay in for at least the first two, possibly three weeks, because you're not going to be, because of quarantine, it is, and, and unfortunately it's unlikely that the US is going to be added to the list of countries that are not going to be quarantined. Um, so I think, you know, it's just something you need to bear in mind. But if you do think, oh, well, maybe I will look at halls, you need to get on with it because the halls are being allocated. And if you want your choice, then you need to be doing it soon. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, that's all we can say. We're not, I not, I'm not saying this is a bad thing if you live privately, but if you do decide to live privately, it would be helpful for us if you're living with current scholars, for example, it'd be helpful for us to know who it is you're planning to live with just so that we have an idea of where you're going to be and who you are living with. Um, remembering, especially around London, the other thing to consider in London is that, you know, at the moment public transport is running, but people are being advised not to use public transport. So often private residencies in 
the scholars who live in London live not in the centre of London. They live sort of further away, 30 minutes away from their campus by public transport. And, you know, if you like walking, then you're absolutely fine. But, you know, it may be that when you first arrive, it might be quite difficult to, um, to take public transport. I mean, it's one of the main reasons why Helen and I are not back in our offices up in London is because they can't guarantee safety for people coming up into London. So that, that's housing, that's all I'm gonna say. Obviously, if you have questions, you can ask them now or you can ask them later. Um, I do but, actually, I've got one, one more thing that I was just gonna add, which is that to, surrounding, um, one of the issues surrounding finding private housing is that often you need um, a guarantor. So I'm not sure if that's a t the, the same term that you use in the States, but it basically means that because you're a student, they don't necessarily trust that you'll pay your rent on time. Um, so they will request that you have somebody who lives in the UK who owns a property in the UK that will guarantee to pay your rent if you don't. So that's quite difficult to find. And although there are services that do sort of offer that, it, they're sometimes quite expensive. So you should just be really careful when you are looking um, into private housing, if that's something you're considering, that you make sure that you wouldn't have to pay six months run, rent up front because you don't have a guarantor, which is something that um, we have had scholars do in the past and then obviously then there's a lockdown and suddenly you've paid rent until July and even if you've got a contract that you can get out of all of a sudden you've already paid your rent. <laughs> so I mean and the other thing is if you are if you oh, as I said we're strongly recommending that you do not sign any contracts before you arrive in the UK but if you have contracts or if you've had somebody go and look at an apartment and they've said it's fine then you know and you want to just double check it with I mean, Helen rents so or has rented in the past so I am no longer a renter I've just no, bought no, a she flat so I resent that Mary I do not <laughs> rent anymore <laughs> she's bought a flat but in the past, I have never rented so therefore by definition Helen is more of an expert at looking at these tenancy agreements okay yeah I'll take that, that that's might. fine <laughs> something that might cause you a problem so we will try and help where we can so just just so just so you know um, on other things, um, I mentioned in my email about, um, it, does anybody, maybe I should pause, does anybody have any questions? You don't have to put them in the chat. I suspect that, um, I mean, there are, there's 34 of you here, but I'm guessing that you won't, well, you might all try and ask um, questions at the same time, but. So just um. moving. Oh, go, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I, I do have a quick question. Um, so I know a couple of us have, our, our universities have already announced that we will be fully online. Um, and I was wondering if there's any way that um, potentially the two of you are able to maybe coordinate like a, a more group style uh, flat that's actually owned by the university. Because I know oftentimes it's the individual student will kind of just get a room within that. But if it's possible to coordinate maybe a group of marshals that are from the same university, um, if there are any communication networks for that, or if that might be an option, that would be great to know. Thank you very much. Um, so because, I mean, because it's Cambridge, you're all at different colleges. So the colleges manage, um, manage accommodation. So there, so sorry, is it Ryan? Sorry, Ryan. Rand, so oh, no oh, sorry. <laughs> Looking at this, I, I should put my glasses on. Sorry. Um, so the University of London doesn't actually own, uh, they have intercollegiate housing and stuff. So, um, there are certainly some townhouses, but SOAS is a bit weird because I'm not really sure how, SOAS doesn't always have the same access to the intercollegiate halls, but I know that there were some, so it's possible, yeah, I mean, I'm not sure that we can manage it, but we could certainly, if you were all applying for a similar um, place in university halls, we could certainly look at that. I mean, obviously, if you apply for good enough, uh, even though you, you won't be living in the same flat, you're living in that community. So that, that community is not a bad community to live in. Um, I will say that uh, some, you may have got feedback about what happened with Good Enough and with some of the other halls of residence at lockdown. I think that was an exception rather than a rule. I think that they, everybody, including Cambridge Colleges and everybody else, basically was like, oh, you all have to leave now because we don't know what to do. I don't think that's going to happen again because I think that none of them could afford for that to happen again. So I think that those sorts of things will change. Um, but yeah, I mean, let me just make a note or Helen make a note. Um, we should just look at the, there's, there's the U, I think the UCL, they're in behind Houston. 
um, housing. We'll have a look and we'll let you know, see if we can do something. Um, I can't guarantee, I know that you may all think we're all powerful, but unfortunately we're not necessarily as powerful as we'd like to be with some of the universities, but we'll certainly have a look and see if there's something that we could maybe arrange for that. Because it, yeah, I agree. It could be, although I agree to a point, but also the whole point of this scholarship is for you to get to know other people other than Marshall Scholars. So, you know, <laughs> that's the, the flip side of that. Um, has anybody else got any questions? No, okay, as I said, you can always email myself or Helen if you do have questions. We're always happy to answer. There's um, one in the chat. Oh, one in the chat. Oh my, you really are gonna make me put my glasses on, really? Do you want me to read it out? <laughs> no, I can read it with my glasses. So the question is, with the quarantine period, do the recommendations for packing change? I'm not sure if there's any new different way that we should need to make sure we have in our suitcase. Okay, that's a really, no, I think that's a really good question. It was what I was about to move on to. So, um, so it's around packing and what you bring. So um, I know I said in my email that we're really recommending this year that you use um, our shipping container because, mostly because unlike it, in a normal year, what happens is there's a bus that comes and then it has this massive trailer behind it, which basically fills with the many, many bags and musical instruments and everything else that all Marshall Scholars bring. And this year, obviously, we're probably gonna have to organize taxis to pick you up at the airports. And so we can't, there's just not gonna be, the, not unless we put each of you in a single taxi, there just isn't gonna be the capacity for you to bring as much luggage. So we do recommend that you use our shipping container or you arrange your own shipping to the UK. You're entitled to claim that. There's a fee, we, there's a, an amount that we will pay for that. We are looking at ways that we can try and help you get your stuff to um, the shipping container in New, in New, New York, New York. Um, that will arrive, it usually arrives in early September and then they hold on to it until you've arrived and then they um, will distribute it. So the question about what should you bring if you're quarantining, um, is a good question. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling to think of anything that would be really specific that you would need because you're quarantining other than, you know, your computer, something to watch TV on, not a TV because they don't work here. So, you know, a tablet. Um, and then, you know, a good stock of any kind of drugs that you might need, um, any kind of toiletries, those sorts of things that for two weeks, um, you'll be able to, um, survive on. I mean, look at it as a two week vacation where you're not allowed to leave. Um, and what would you take on a two week vacation? Um, I would recommend sweaters, um, and, um, who knows, September, it's usually quite warm here. It can be up to 80 degrees. So um, we've had, very, although not this week, we've had exceptionally warm weather for the entire lockdown. Um, it got up to um, the high 90, 90s a couple of weeks ago. So we all died because it's, we don't have air conditioning. So <laughs> that was not as much fun. We were all wishing we were in the office that day. But, um, yeah, I think, you know, as we get closer to this as well, I will, we will send you sort of some advice on this sort of thing. And I think that the universities will probably send out stuff as well. But from what I can tell, the universities are hoping to support you all. And actually stuff that you're missing, you could always get from um, the grocery deliveries because a lot of these grocery stores do everything and that you can get that delivered. So, um, we will talk to you a little bit about all of that during orientation, but I, I don't think there's anything specific that I can think of that you think, I think apart from things like making sure you've got plenty of the drugs that you might need or things that you would need. Um, I think that's, that would be the only thing I would say. So what else have I got to tell you? Um, Mary, I had a question. Yes. Hi. Uh, so in terms of the shipping containers, are we planning on sending those out a couple weeks before we fly over? No, when... it will be, there'll be a fixed date in August. Okay. So um, Helen has, we haven't actually organized it yet because we put it on hold until we knew what was going on. 
but mm. um, normally it's like the second week of August, the, um, the mm. date for your stuff to get there. So we'll send you all the information. You have to do a packing list. You have to do all kinds of different things. So, um, and the only thing I would say about it is make sure you have some kind of insurance because it is a container, it is a ship. You know, these things sometimes get damaged. Most of the time they don't, but you know, it's good to have insurance. I wouldn't put anything that you, you value more than your life, any kind of heirlooms, anything that really matters to you in your shipping. So those, those can come with you on, you can wear all your jewelry, your crown, <laughs> anything else you've got um, on the plane. But um, the, so you know. Good for bulky coats. Yeah, bulky good for coats. Yeah, jackets and stuff like that. It's good for, I mean, send as much as you can, but also remember that we're not a developing country. You can pretty much buy everything here that you can buy in the US. I, and in fact, increasingly now more than ever, um, you can even buy toilet paper and flour now. I mean, it's quite amazing. It's a miracle. So, <laughs> but yeah, I, I mean, we do sometimes, you know, sometimes you see people um, packing this and they've kind of packed they brought all kinds of things that you kind of think, well, why would you need that? Because you can buy that here. But if you're not sure, if you if you if there's something that you can't live without and you're not sure whether you can get it, peanut butter. Here you go. The peanut butter here is terrible. I am known for going to the US and bringing back large amounts of peanut butter in my suitcase, which lasts me for throughout the year. Um, but yeah, so if you're a peanut butter addict, you might want to bring some of that. It's because peanut butter here only has peanuts in it and nothing else. So realistically, it's probably much better for you <laughs> if you buy it in the UK, but, you know, fair enough. <laughs> so, so if we are arriving in mid-September around, when would we expect to have access to the stuff that we shipped over? In the so, it, it should, so normally, in a normal year, it would arrive about, usually about a week, a few days or up to a week after you've arrived. But what we won't be doing is, I mean, obviously, when you're in quarantine, it can't really be delivered during the quarantine period because then you'd have to go. If it's, for example, if it's delivered to your college, it's delivered to the Porter's Lodge. So then it would be sitting in the Porter's Lodge and you wouldn't be able to go and get it. So what we're planning on doing is making sure we can tell when the container usually arrives in um, early September. So we can tell them the date that you want it delivered. So we can do it that way so that you know, the day that you are released from quarantine and free, you, you know, your stuff can arrive and then you can sort it all out then. All right, thank you. Okay. Any other questions about that? Uh, Just, I had a uh, question, sorry, I had a question regarding flights. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm gonna be in South Korea for most of August. Mm -hmm. um, and I, is it possible for the flights to be arranged maybe up to a certain price from like Seoul to London or is that, does it have to be from the United States? Cause then I'll have to buy plane tickets back to the U S and then I have to quarantine. But you're going to have to go back to the U S anyway, probably because you're going to have to get your visa. The visa oh, interviews right. are done here. They can't be done in like embassies at, at no, anywhere else. It has to be done in the country that you're resident in. So you're going to have to return to the U S to get your visa anyway. Right. Okay. So that, and that's probably a good point to move on to the dreaded visa stuff anyway. So the answer to the question is, if you had your visa already, we would reimburse you up to the amount that um, we would have paid if we'd have been flying you from your hometown to the UK. Okay. So in that case, we would ask you to organize your own flights and then reimburse you. All right. But as I said, there is all kinds of visa implications. So visas. So first of all, I have to say that I am a qualified immigration advisor. Any advice that I give you here is only based on the information that I have to hand um, and is not detailed. Um, you have all signed client care letters. Um, any detailed advice that I will give you will be accurate and will be according to any of the laws in the UK. Right, that's that bit done. Um, because it's illegal to give immigration advice if you are not qualified. So actually Helen is not currently qualified. She's working at it. She's going to be soon, but um, she isn't qualified at the moment. So I am the only qualified immigration advisor. This also means that if any of the current scholars have given you immigration advice, they are doing it illegally and you should disregard any advice being given because it may not be accurate. 
Uh, I'm sure none of them have because they have been told that they mustn't give you immigration advice, but just in case you've been told one thing or another. Um, so the good news is, is today I saw on the um, VFS website, which is the people that do the biometrics in the US, that they are reopening and that hopefully by the end of the month, all the passport offices in the US will also be reopened, which will allow you to actually be able to apply for your visas. This is one of the things that's been keeping me and Helen up at night is the fact that we might be able to get you here, you might be allowed to come here, but without a visa, you're not allowed to come to the UK. Now, visas, getting visas, I have no idea how difficult it is going to be this year, how slow it's going to be, what the, how difficult it's going to be to make an appointment to get your biometrics. We have a special arrangement with the government around getting your visa. The visa is free. You don't pay for it. You get a waived visa. You get a waived um, NHS tariff fee. So that's great for you. That means you get free healthcare. Yes, free healthcare um, in, in the UK. And that will all be paid for. So that's really good news. But... Um, you do have to give your biometrics. We get an expedited visa, which is usually takes between five and 10 working days. You cannot travel to the UK without that visa. You cannot travel to the UK as a tourist and then try and change your visa. You cannot, um, get, you have to submit your passport in order to get your visa. So there will be a period of time where you will have, a, you won't have your passport. Now, obviously some of you may have two, that's fine. If you need to travel on a second passport whilst you're applying for your visa in, for the UK, that's fine. Whilst you are resident in the US, you have to apply in the US um, and you will need to wait until you have your CAS, from, which is the CAS, we call it a CAS, uh, from your university before you apply. When you do get your CAS, you need to wait for us to provide you with your visa pack because your visa pack has your confirmation letter it has all kinds of things that you need in order to apply. And we also have very detailed guidance on how you're supposed to complete the application form. So please, please, please do not try and do this on your own. Uh, if you get it wrong, it's really hard for us to undo. If any of you, I don't think, I think now none of you have spent any time in countries, more than six months in a country that um, requires a TB test and haven't been back in the UK. US for more than six months. So I think you're all fine now. If you're not, I sent that information out quite a while ago. If there's somebody here who thinks that maybe they aren't, that they might need a TB test, please let me know because you can't actually be tested in the US, weirdly. It's a very strange thing. Um, also, if anybody has any kind of criminal convictions, you need to have told me. And if you haven't told me, you need to tell me soon. If any of you have DUIs, um, traffic stops, any of those sorts of things, and some people do, maybe not the DUIs, but the traffic stops and stuff. There are things that you will need to declare on your application. You should declare them. You shouldn't worry too much about it, but they have access to the various databases. And if you don't declare it, it could be seen as an omission. So if you're worried about any of that stuff, please do tell us um, and we'll give you advice. We can also notify the people in Sheffield who are doing making the decisions on visas and saying this person has this, is this okay? No, no, you know, it's, it is usually fine, but we do need no surprises. Also, those of you who have middle names, I know there are a lot of you with middle names, please make sure you put them on your visa application as it appears on your passport because Otherwise, your, part, your application may not be valid. And then Helen and I have to write a letter saying, even though this person says that they are John Smith, they're actually John Adam Smith. Um, so um, I know that we asked in your application originally that you list all your names and some of you didn't, and that's fine. So maybe, you're, maybe you hate your middle name, I, I'm not really sure, but, um, or you've forgotten about it, I really don't know. But also, we also know that sometimes your passport name is completely different to your actual name. We're not, again, this is one of our confusions here in the UK. Your passport is your definitive ID document. In the US, it's not so not really the case. So we've had people with variations and spellings on their last names. We've had people who have middle names in some places or five middle names and then only two middle names. It's 
you know, a variation of all kinds of things. Sometimes they just can't fit it on, fit it on the passport. So just make sure that when you're filling out your visa application, you use the names as they appear on your passport. Um, have I forgotten anything? I should probably say, so what you're going to get when you get your visa is a 30 day, what they're calling a 30 day vignette. And basically, as soon as you enter the, U you have to enter the UK within those 30 days. So don't panic when you get a vignette, a sticker in your passport that only is a month. They haven't made a mistake, that's how it works. Once you get to the UK, you'll receive what they call a BRP, which you'll pick up probably from your university, although it may be mailed to you this year. I'm not really sure how they're going to work that. Um, and you um, will get, this is your actual visa and it will have the full duration on it. Before you arrive, you must send Helen and I a copy of the vignette, the sticker in your passport, and also a letter, there's a letter that you get, which we call the decision letter. So you need to send us a copy of that as well because we keep a record of that and it helps us. If anything's wrong, we can spot it and get it fixed before you come. So all of those things um, are really important. Um, is it, if you haven't told us that you have another nationality and you hold another passport, or if you hold an ID card from another country, please do let us know that as well. I think we know about everybody, but just in case it's a secret and you don't want to tell us, but we kind of need to know so we can just make sure that there aren't any problems in your application. Does anybody have any questions about? Oh, and I also should say that when we're looking at arrival dates, certainly those of you who are, who are not starting your courses until much later, some courses have been moved until the middle of October, you will only be able to enter the UK no more than 30 days before your course starts so that will be whatever happens that will be if you decide you want to arrive in the UK earlier than the two weeks before your course you can only arrive two weeks before uh, 30 days before your course starts just so you're aware does anybody have any questions on that Mary I have a quick question um, do they consider the middle names as a first name or other name because today I was completing my CAS and I just wrote my first name as what's like on my identification cards, but I didn't write my middle name. So um, going back through that, would I have to include it in my first name in like visa applications and altering so the CAS? So you, you, your CAS needs to be right as well, but they probably used your passport. So um, just make sure, and Helen will spot this anyway, but you might want to just contact them and say that my full name as it appears on my passport is this. Um, it is, I know it's a little bit weird because we call last names surnames and first names and it's all, you know, we all have different terminology, but what you need to do is give them your name as it appears on your passport. That's probably the key area. Okay, thank you. Does anybody else have any questions or anything in there? There's a question in the chat. Yeah, yeah, same. God, man. Okay. So are there any health related things that need to be done for the universities or the UK? So the answer to that question is no, in as much as that you will get healthcare once you arrive in the UK. Most universities do ask you to be if, um, vaccinated against uh, uh, meningitis and meningococcal or whatever it is. Um, and I, it's, on, it's on some of our guidance um, and we'll, we'll send that out again meningitis is one of the standard things, but I suspect that most of you have had to have all these vaccinations to register at your universities in the US anyway. So, but they don't normally check. It's not the same as in the US where you wouldn't be allowed to register if you haven't got those vaccinations. So I won't worry too much. Um, as far as health things go, I would recommend that you bring a supply of whatever drugs you take uh, with you. And I would bring, if you can get more than one month supply, I'd bring them with you. Um, if you take, now, so this year we've done the medical form slightly differently and allowed you to, and we, ha we aren't really checking them from the point of view of what drugs may or may not be available. If you're not sure whether your drugs will be available in the UK, then, you know, please feel free to um, let me know. And I will, part, we have a medical awards administrator, so I can ask the question about that. Some drugs are called different things. 
a lot of this you can find out by Googling. Um, but just be aware that things may be called different names. It might be slightly different. Ladies, your contraception is free. Woohoo! So if you take the contraceptive pill, um, it is completely free in the UK. You don't have to pay for it. So that is good news for everybody. Um, and you can, um, but you may find that you have to change the type that you take just because the, the brands change from different, in, different, in the different countries. So you may need to watch out for that. Uh, for all other prescription items, you pay nine pounds something per item for anything. So if it's prescribed by a GP in the UK, which is a general practitioner, a doctor, you will pay nine pounds sixty. Is it? I don't know. I don't pay. Not because I'm doing anything illegal. I should add. <laughs> um, but it's um, about. Oh yeah. Why am I asking Helen? Helen never takes any kind of prescription drugs either. So. Um, but yeah, so it's about £9.60, I think, per item. And most doctors will give you three months supply. So you won't have to worry about the kind of monthly stuff that happens in the US often. So you will get three months supply. But again, if you're worried about a drug that you take that you think you might not be able to get in the UK, um, you can have your drugs shipped here. If you can get your parents to arrange to get your prescriptions and get them sent here, you can do that too. Um, there are some drugs around... Um, so stuff like um, ADHD medications, some drugs where anxiety medications where they are differently prescribed in the UK to the US. And that means that in the UK, they are often considered not to be long term drugs. And so in certain circumstances, that might happen. And again, if you're worried about something, just email myself or Helen we will keep it completely confidential. Um, we may consult with our medical awards administrator, but we'll be able to let you know what, whether, whether it's available. Most of you, in fact, we will advise all of you when you arrive in the UK to register with a GP, a doctor, uh, so that you have someone. And if, I think in this time of COVID and everything else, that's probably even more important. A lot of the campuses have doctors. Please pay attention to the doc. You know, if there's a webinar on health at your university, make sure that you attend it and find out where it is. As far as mental health stuff goes, um, there is support on the NHS, but it's oversubscribed and so it sometimes can be hard to access. The universities themselves do also offer mental health support, but again, sometimes that's hard to access. So if you do have a therapist in the US that's willing to continue to see you online or um, you know, virtually, then that might be a way of just touching in if you do feel that you need somebody to talk to. Um, but we will try and do everything we can to make sure you do get the mental health support that you need. We have information about where, where which, what's available at all the universities. And again, you're going to be talking to the universities yourself. So hopefully they will also be able to give you some more advice on that. The Marshall Commission is not responsible for looking after your mental health. Uh, but obviously Helen and I are both here. We are always willing to talk and chat to you and listen and signpost you to different places if you need it. So, you know, that is always there and we can't help you if you don't tell us. And I think that's probably one of the things I will continue to say is that if you don't tell us about things that happen to you or that are problems, you know, we can't help you if you don't tell us about it. And generally, you know, we can help in one way or another, or we can point you to someone that can help. So, you know, do please keep, we're not scary people. Anything you tell us will not impact your scholarship. Um, it's very rare that we terminate a scholarship. In fact, it hasn't happened in a long time. And that's usually because of bad behavior, people doing things that have brought the scholarship into disrepute. So, you know, there's very little that you can tell me. I've been doing this 19 years. There's very little you can tell me that I haven't heard before. So, you know, please do feel safe um, to talk to us. We're not scary, I don't think. Sometimes. People say I am, but, you know, I don't think I am. I have a cat, you know. He turns up sometimes, hashtag unofficial martial cat, occasionally turns up for things. Um, and as you've seen over the last, over, over lockdown, we are trying to support you in whatever ways we can by sending you silly things and poems and all kinds of other things. So does anybody have any questions on health issues? And let me check the chat to see if there's anything else. Uh, uh, uh. 
okay, coronavirus. No, you don't have to pay. So what happens if you get coronavirus in the UK? Well, uh, if you get coronavirus in the UK, you can apply for a home test to confirm that you have it. You will have to isolate for uh, 14 days. Um, healthcare is free. So if you get really sick and you have to go to intensive care, healthcare is free, no charges, no bills. You will be treated, you will be looked after. Um, I hope that none of you will get that sick with it, uh, but we have had scholars who've had COVID um, and have been ill, but haven't had to go to hospital. hospital. Ambulances are free, hospitals are free, GPs are free. Dentists, you have to pay a little bit, but it's pretty much free. Prescriptions, nine pounds per item. So this is a social, socialist healthcare system. Everything you, all of your healthcare, except for things like some mental health stuff where you pay, you might have to pay private. Um, if you decide to go private, if you decide to use a private um, healthcare system, then you will have to pay for that. But the NHS is actually a pretty amazing system. They coped incredibly well throughout this pandemic. Um, you know, we're all so proud of them. And, you know, it is a great health healthcare system. It has its faults, but so does the US system. You know, it, it isn't perfect by any means, but you will always have access to healthcare. And for COVID, there is a call, a line that you call. Well, it's a general line, which is 111, the opposite of 999, which is what you dial for an ambulance. But if you dial 111, you will get a medic uh, qualified medical um, professional. And especially at the moment, when people are showing symptoms of COVID, they're told to ring that line because obviously they don't want people turning up at hospitals. Now, those of you that come from states with mandated masks, at the moment, the UK is not really masking up. Um, and that's because we haven't been told to. It's not because of any kind of ethical or political or anything else kind of situation. It's just because We've, at the moment, in England, only been told that we have to wear it in, on public transport. In Scotland, they've been told they have to wear it in, on public transport and on, um, in shops. I suspect by the time you come, it's going to be way more universal. But at the moment, that isn't the case. Um, but I, I'm almost certain that by the time, in the next month or so, things will change in the U UK. And actually, that is just something else that you should be aware of. You aware of? I know that some of you are going to Scotland. One of you is going to Northern Ireland. They have different um, rules and regulations around COVID, around the lockdown. At the moment, you can go to a pub in the in England, but you can't go to a pub in Wales. Uh, there's a village in um, on the border between Wales and England, and they have two pubs, and one's on the Welsh side, and one's on the English side, and the one on the Welsh side is not open yet, and the one on the English side is. Um, so it's all so you need to be aware that there are slightly different rules and regulations in Scotland and Northern Ireland to England, but it's not it's fairly easy to to follow what what the regulations are and i'm I'm hopeful that by the time we get to September, although I'm going to touch every piece of wood I can find, um, things will be clearer and there will be things that will be more open. Yeah. Um, so, and also, so if something happens, um, so if we end up like we did this year, we locked down again. I don't know how much you know about what happened this year with the scholars, but we did uh, waive one of our restrictions on the amount of time spent outside the US. We paid for scholars to return to the US if they wanted to, uh, but we didn't make, we didn't mandate that. And in fact, the majority, the larger number of our scholars remained in the UK. Uh, one of the things I would say is that you do need to, if you, you do need to be aware, if you're able to, to keep your health, some kind of health insurance in the US. The reason we say this is because if you were to travel home for the holiday period and you were to fall and break your leg and you don't have health insurance, then, you know, you, you know I don't need to lecture you guys about the realities of the US healthcare system. So, just if you're able to um, keep health insurance, if your parents are able to cover you, 
then we would recommend it. If not, then you obviously maybe want to think about using travel insurance. Um, but just just be aware. I mean, some for some of our scholars who stayed in the UK, they stayed in the UK because they didn't have health insurance in the US. And that was probably a very sensible decision given um, that the reason that you would return was because of illness. So um, I'm not making any political statements about any of this, by the way. Um, it is what it is. As, as, a fair, as a very famous Mary Denyer saying, it's not better or worse, it's just different. And it's gonna be one of these things you're gonna to have to learn. It's the truth about it. We are two different cultures united by a language that is vaguely similar, not always the same. So yeah, so as far as um, th that goes, that's just something to bear in mind if it's possible. Don't panic if it's not. I understand that it isn't always possible for everybody and you know, people have different um, abilities. So don't worry about it too much. One other one. Yeah, this might be a dumb question, but is there such a thing as private health care or private health insurance in the UK? Yes, and is there, there is. Is there a situation where that might cover some uh, kind of uh, shortcomings of the NHS? So the answer to the question is that private health care is not cheap, actually still probably cheaper than the US. You would still need to go through your GP, NHS GP to use it. So it has to be, you have to get a referral to use it. Um, certainly it, it makes things faster. So if you have knee surgery that you need that isn't urgent, you know, you've got some kind of sporting injury that, you know, you've had for ages, you need kind of elective surgery, that's going to take a while. If you do it privately, it'll be done in a couple of weeks. You could pay for it privately without having insurance, but it's not cheap, you know, and there are some things, you know, the NHS, sometimes you're going to have to wait for things if it's not an emergency. Uh, and depending on what's going on with the pandemic, that might be exacerbated or not. Um, although having said that, I had to go to the emergency room for my father on Saturday morning and we were in and out in an hour and that never happens. You know, normally you sit around for three or four hours waiting and he, we were in and out in an hour. So that sort of shows what's going on at the moment. But yeah, you can do private insurance. You don't need, I guess the answer to the question is you don't need to. The only place I would say that you would definitely, it would be a benefit is around the mental health. If you need a therapist, a counselor, then I, I don't know that you necessarily need insurance, but you, you can pay for that. And, you know, depending on that, that can be anything from 50 pounds to a hundred pounds a session. Um, but, you know, I, you know, hopefully none of you will need that, but yeah, I, I, I don't think you really, and in fact, I don't think you're actually entitled to a lot of the private health insurances in the UK, much of the same way that if I moved to the U S I'd only be able to apply for certain things as a non U S citizen. But honestly, I don't think you need to pay the money for it because the NHS is, unless you need something that is elective, um, then you might. But we had somebody who playing lacrosse last year tore his shoulder and the NHS did his surgery within a month. So, and it was all free, which is my refrain. It's all free. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions on that? Since you mentioned travel outside of the US and UK, I was wondering if, um, and I know this might be contingent upon a lot of things that nobody can really quite predict yet, but I was wondering if travel from the UK to the EU would be restricted anyhow, because the US has been kind of on the do not come list. And so, if say we presented our passports at the border, if we'd be stopped or something. I think Helen has the answer to that because she Googled it today. Oh. <laughs> um, um, as you would have a, like a, a longer term visa in, for the UK, you would be um, exempt from, from that So because you wouldn't be traveling from the US and you would be able to show that you were living in the UK. Um, it would be okay. You would not be banned. At the moment. At the moment. Yeah, that could change. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, Stephen, it's more than possible that by January, none of us are going to be able to travel to Europe either because we're not going to be part of the EU anymore and we're all going to need a Schengen visa so you know we might all be in the same boat 
who That's knows? Cool. But at the moment, as a US citizen traveling to the EU under the regulations around um, the lockdown, you'd be fine. And also just to say that we will be reimposing our regulations around the amount spent amount of time spent outside of the UK, um, unless there's another lockdown, uh, unless there's an, another emergency. At the moment, the intention is as of the beginning of your tenure, you will be allowed 30 days on stipend outside of the UK for personal reasons. Um, and then there's, some, there's another allowance for um, if you need to do it for academic reasons. But obviously with travel and everything else, we're gonna be sort of saying to you, do you really need to do that travel? Uh, obviously, we're not stopping you from going and seeing your families and everything else, and you can organize your vacations and stuff, but your vacations are gonna take longer because depending on quarantine in whichever state you happen to be in, and you know, increasingly complicated about whether you can fly through one state or another, you know, that's all gonna bear it in mind. The other thing we also would say to you is just watch out if you are booking flights for yourself in general. Uh, we've noticed a lot of cheap flights, certainly from the West Coast that go via Canada. This is a problem. You're not allowed into Canada at the moment. So you can't fly to a Canadian airport and then fly to the UK. So just be aware that that might change. But at the moment, Canada is not letting US citizens unless it's essential travel into Canada. So you can't fly via Canada. Um, I also am very aware that you haven't had your new handbook. And that's because Helen and I need to rewrite it because we needed to wait until we've made a decision about, there was no point us sending you a handbook that said, you'll all arrive together at the same plane on the same day and do this, this and this. So we are rewriting it. We hope to get that done in the next week or so, don't we, Helen, even though we haven't talked about it? Yeah. Um, and then we, will, we then we have to get it designed and published and made look pretty, and then we will send it out to you. The majority of the rules that you have already seen in your handbook that we sent you, the one for last year, will still apply. We're beefing up the code of conduct. We will probably be, we're going to be trying to include some information or actually some training within the orientation around respect, about selection sexual harassment, around um, equality, those sorts of things. So just be aware that we will be doing that and we will be beefing up the code of conduct to make sure that, um, and we will be asking all of you to sign up to those things because it's a very important part. We're also adding a social media policy into our handbook as well. And again, you'll need to pay attention to that social media policy. Uh, we are not trying to infringe any kind of First Amendment rights, but, um, Obviously, there are certain things that we would prefer you not to say in social media that would bring the, might bring the scholarship into disrepute. So um, that that's an important aspect of it. Does anybody else? No. So I'm, uh, we, any questions on anything? And there is no such thing as a stupid question. Yeah, I have a couple of questions. Oops. You There's go, Crystal. Question. Okay. Awesome. Great. And I'll also um, post them so that people can see what I'm asking. Great. So as the folks who are definitely prof professionals on the realities of the Marshall Scholarship, I had some questions about just the current time that we're in as far as protests and things. Mm -hmm. So first, I would love to know if there are any specific anti-racist actions in motion on the commission's end. Um, and then secondly, I would love to know the policies and thoughts as far as scholars protesting and using social media platforms to advocate for social and political change. So there's no restrictions at all, apart from not getting arrested, preferably. Um, so no violent protests, but as far as if you wish to protest, you are, there are no restrictions. We, I mean, obviously we'd prefer you didn't march with a banner that says, Marshall scholarships on it if it's a, a, an anti-government one given that the government is paying for your paying for your scholarship but on the whole no there are no restrictions as far as what the Marshall Commission is doing um, well I mean I, the Marshall Commission has always been working towards equality and anti-racist spaces and we've always been working towards that we are currently working with the UK Civil Service on um, a connection with the what they what we call in the UK well I don't call it this but this is the official terminology BAME network uh, BAME which is for the minority networks in the civil service and uh, we currently have a group of scholars and a group from that network who are working together to create a program for that 
Um, as I mentioned, we are going to be doing some training for scholars. The commissioners all do unconscious bias training. All of our committees, all our selection committees do unconscious bias training. Um, we have a series of speakers that are coming up um, who are going to be talking about various different things and issues. Um, and we are open to listening. I mean, the, the only proviso I have to say is that we are a British government scholarship and I work for the British government and anything that we do or say has to be cleared through, sometimes through Downing Street. So, you know, sometimes we can't be as agile as we might like to be on certain things, but it is certainly something that the commission is discussing and they have a scholars ex scholar experience committee, which includes members of the scholars themselves who talk about this stuff. And so we are working on all of that. I can't give you a definitive, like, this is what we're going to be doing because, you know, there are only certain things that we can talk about, but we do work towards that and we make sure we want to make sure that we're supporting all of our scholars whether you be from uh, wherever you may be from or whatever background you may come from. Lawson, did you. you want, did, Lawson, did you? I had a question about um, how banks are gonna work with our quarantine schedules. If we have to get to the UK and be in quarantine for two weeks, but we probably need to be paying for groceries during that time. Um, if there's any sort of forward action that we can do while we're in the US to work on that. So I think it's unlikely that you can with bank accounts. Bank accounts, because of all the anti-laundering legislation in the UK and in the EU, it's quite hard. They're, they're not the easiest thing to, um, to um, open. However, now, and I'm, I'm optimistic that this will be happening, um, we provide all of our scholars with a cash passport. So it's essentially one of a, a MasterCard that has money loaded onto it. So, and it's, it behaves in the same way as a credit card. So you will get that. I'm, I'm still trying to work out how we're gonna do this because obviously we have to mail it to you. So, uh, and clearly I'm not in the office. So mailing things is not quite as easy as one would hope it would be. Um, but we are working on work, putting that together and we'll either mail those cards to you. It may be that I have to FedEx them all to you in the US so you have them before you arrive and then we'll load the money onto them. But what you normally would get on that is um, the number of days of stipend that you get from the date you arrived to the 1st of October, plus um, what we call the book allowance, which is not really a book allowance, it's just basically some extra money. So um, you, you, should have, you should have somewhere between, I think usually is somewhere between, usually around 1,000 to 1,500 pounds on that. So that should allow you the time to be able to open uh, a bank account. Now, if that doesn't work, we'll obviously try and work out something else. We used to be able to try get bank accounts opened on your behalf, but the rules and the laws have changed so much that it's almost impossible to do now. But again, the universities will have stuff in place as well. And it may be the worst case scenario is that we have to pay the universities some money and they have to give it to you in a different way, but I don't think that will happen. I'm hoping that these cash passports that we've used in previous years will be that will work. So you shouldn't worry too much. Obviously you might want to bring some cash with you or you want to make sure that you've got some a credit card that has some availability of um, spend just in case. But yeah, that, that, we hope that we will be able to get, get you what you need before you open your bank accounts. Uh, and and that's, that's true whether you're in COVID lockdown or not, that's always been the case. Any other questions? Just trying to think. So cell phones, just so, so oh, actually there is another thing around um, private renting that I just wanted to say, is that obviously you need Wi-Fi to do your courses because a lot of you are gonna be doing some stuff online, if not all. Not all rented accommodate, privately rented accommodation comes with Wi-Fi. And if it doesn't come with Wi-Fi ready set up, be warned, it may take a while to get Wi-Fi set up. So it's something you need to bear in mind. Uh, and it's a question you probably need to ask any property that you're looking at just to make sure that you do have Wi-Fi access. Um, also cell phones, we don't recommend specifically any network just because what might work for me might not work for you. But I, this is one of the things that current scholars can definitely sort of recommend different um, 
what networks obviously most of you now have you have smartphones if you have locked smartphones you might want to make sure that it is unlocked when you arrive in the UK so you can because you can buy these pay as you go um, sim cards or actually a lot of them are actually free and then add money onto them and then you know you can use that temporarily until you can get a contract cell phone contracts are significantly cheaper in the UK than they are in the US um, I pay 16 pounds a month for unlimited text calls and 10 megabytes of data so and I mean you could pay 20 pounds a month and be unlimited so you know it is very different to the costs that you may have encountered in the US I know some of you have whizzy ways of using Google to forward your US phone number to your regular number um, and all of those things will be valid although I think we've all just basically lived like this on Zoom and Teams or whatever other hangout you might use but yeah so just be aware if you do decide to live privately you know and, and they don't already have wi-fi you're going to have to sort that out and it isn't something that's going to happen in 24 hours it may take up to two weeks to sort that out and you can also with sim cards you can also get them sent to you as well so hopefully uh, i what my recommendation would probably be is that when you first arrive you sign up for one of these free pay as you go sim cards just to keep you going until you're able to escape from quarantine and go and look and buy and buy the right whatever you want to buy does anybody else have any other questions no oh yep it's gone in there Uh, so somebody is asking around um, what categories groups might be expected to part earlier or later in the original mid-September date. So you should be able to more or less work out when, you, when we're going to be asking you to travel by the date start date of your course. So your start date of your course, less two weeks for quarantine, will give you a more or less idea about when you will be traveling. I promise you, it, it's really just that Helen and I are trying to do many, many things all at once, that by next week, we will be sending you the dates. For those of you in Scotland, you'll be earlier. There are a few others who will be earlier. There's a whole load of you that are sort of the middle, uh, middle of um, September, first and second week of September. And then there's a few of you that are towards the end of September. But, um, I, you know, it's not something that we are not doing. It is literally, we are just, the commission only made the decision about what we were going to do last week. And I'm just putting together that spreadsheet. Um, uh, but we have it more or less settled. But the proviso is things might change because the universities might change. And if the universities change something, then we'll have to change you. As far as flights go, if your flight gets cancelled, we've been seeing some of that happening um the travel agent will deal with that so you won't need to worry about sort of trying to change things a lot of you are going to have to travel some buyer somewhere um there are only flights from certain places and so you we may need to tr get you to travel from somewhere to somewhere before you can travel to the uk um we've noticed that for example houston not that anybody lives in houston but houston doesn't have any direct flights at the moment to the uk so it's only certain cities that actually have direct flights. So just be aware that we may have to, much as I'd love to fly you all directly, we may have to fly you via different places. Those of you who are going to Yorkshire, into the Yorkshire University will be flying into Manchester um, because it's closer. There's no point us bringing you into London and then you having a five hour drive up to, four hour drive up to, I mean, in American terms, that's like, place that you go to lunch for but for for the UK that's a long way so um, and those of you who are flying to Scotland it is possible that you will be able to fly directly into Edinburgh but it's probable that you'll have to fly via London and then up into Edinburgh so it may be a two-stop flight uh, I'd love to say that it won't be but we've got to get you to the places that we need to get you to um, so we will do what we can uh, we will arrange taxis for you. We will do all that we can to make sure that the um, arrival is simple. Um, 
you won't be using public transport unless it's absolutely necessary. Um, and obviously one of the things during orientation, well, we, we will talk to you about, you know, using public transport and all the other things that we would normally talk to you about, buying train tickets and stuff and other things. So, you know, just be aware that that's, um, that's in the, in the pi pipeline. But as I said, it may be that by Friday, we'll be able to let you know when, um, when more or less when your flight date is, because Helen and I have actually done quite a lot of work on this over this week, but I just don't want to tell you a specific date and then have to come back to you and say, actually, it's going to be later or earlier. But we're beginning, some of the universities are, I think universities are putting in their dates now and, and finalizing those. So we hope that that will be as much as we can. We can't force them to do tell us more information than we have, much as I'd love to. One day I will be the ruler of the world, but until today, until, until then I'll be the ruler of Marshall and that's about it. Or actually maybe the ruler of my cat, although he's just walked downstairs, so I'm not even the ruler of him. <sighs> Bye, because it's dinner time. Anybody else got any questions? And actually the other thing is, if you've got ideas of things that you'd like to do during orientation, virtually, clearly, but virtually, if you once we assign your groups, if there's things that you think the groups will find fun or you'd like to, to ask to see if we can do, then do let us know. I can't guarantee I'm going to be able to do it. Um, there's, only, there's only Helen and I and Anna working on Marshall and we've got a huge amount of stuff going on. But, you know, if, we, if somebody comes up with a brilliant idea, we will happily try and facilitate that. We, are, we know that the British Embassy in Washington will be participating in the orientation. We hope that the British Ambassador will join you for... Um, some kind of event um, and there will be other things. We're hoping that we can arrange some tours of places virtually. Uh, so hope some of you I know attended a, the tour of the v &A Museum in London, which was fun, you know, true night, in, a night at the museum. And so we're hoping that we'll be able to do some other stuff like that as well. And as I said, virtual escape rooms, who knows? I don't know, though, I don't think I have the capacity to do a quiz, but we might be able to do a, some kind of escape room and other things, and things will be set over the two weeks, probably the last week of August, the first week of September. There will be some stuff, that, and there will be some, there may be some stuff in the original arrival week. The Foreign Office wants to organize some workshops that they do normally in person, so they'll probably do that as well. Um, but we hope that there will, it will be maybe not, well, actually, I tell you what, you won't be as tired as you normally are in orientation. Uh, and the only other thing I would say is I don't know whether anybody has talked about the retreat that the scholars normally do, but given the circumstances this year, if anybody was vaguely even thinking about it, I would strongly recommend that you don't. Uh, a group of Marshall scholars in the mountains in Virginia, all together coming from all kinds of different states, is just a recipe for disaster um, from the point of view of COVID. Uh, so. I know, I know that it's one of the things that everybody looks forward to, but unfortunately, I think this year, this is not going to be an option, but there's no reason why you couldn't do something fun over the summer next year, she says, optimistically, because both Imperial College and Oxford are saying that they're getting close to a vaccine. And so I'm keeping my fingers crossed. And the other thing is I will be trying to come and visit as many of you as possible once I'm allowed to properly do this at a social distance. So um, I have a car. I will drive, I will come as far, I'm, um, I may not be able to come all the way to Scotland, but we do have some wonderful people in Scotland that will also be able to meet with you. And we are going to try and do as much as possible. Also, the other thing I didn't, maybe I did mention it, but we are going to um, arrange for you to talk to some of our commissioners as well. And that might be done through our circles as well. And if you hate the word scholar circles, if you can come up with another name, that's fine. I was gonna say bubbles, but that seemed to imply something else where you all live together in a bubble. Uh, so circles it is, if you hate it, you know, if you want to come up with a, another name for them, you know, I'm happy to change that. I had to use a thesaurus to come up with circles. So that's how sad my life is. Anybody else got any questions? Oh, don't chat. Uh, if the coronavirus dies down, would the 2020 Marshall be able to potentially get together in DC next year? I think the reality is that given that you're supposed to be in the UK, the answer probably is that wouldn't be possible. But there's, if I, you know, in the long term, I 
don't see why we couldn't try and organize something for the end of your scholarship in DC. So I'm not making any promises, but I am being recorded. So, you know, you can always point to this recording in two years time and say, but Mary, this is what you said. So, you know, something that the alumni might organize. So um, I, I don't think it's completely out of the question. I just can't, I can't think beyond the next few weeks, let alone the next two, one or two years, but we will try and do what we can. And we will try and make sure that you don't miss out on some of the things that would have traditionally been part of our orientation, except for the exhaustion part, which you won't have to do, which is good news. Any other, oh, we do hope there will be the Marshall dinner next year. I booked it, it's already booked for next May. So we're hoping that that will happen. It didn't happen this year. So I was able to book it for next year. So that's where we bring in a whole load of guests and all the Marshall scholars come to it and some alumni. Um, we're also gonna try and connect you with some of the UK alumni as well. There's some amazing people here. Some of you who've been um, following the Hangouts will have seen Steve Brissati in Edinburgh. The good news is those of you at Edinburgh, once everything is opened up again, he, will inv he has invited you to all go and visit his lab and see the dinosaurs. I'm not sure they're real ones, but who knows. I never know with Steve. I mean, he is working on Jurassic Park at the moment, so you never know that amber may be being developed just as, you, as we speak. Um, but yeah, so we will be doing what we can. And again, we're here. Um, and if you need us, you only have to ask for our help and we will do what we can. So I guess that's all, I, all we can say and do. But, you know, we, we are here to support you. Um, I've been doing this a long time and... There isn't much I see, haven't seen, but please don't try and create something that I haven't seen just for the hell of it. But um, we are always willing to try and help. And if you just want a conversation, um, you know, happy to just chat. Um, I'm a historian. I'm an American studies major. I lived in South Florida. I went to the University of South Florida, Tampa Bay. I did sunbathing 101, lying by the pool 101. Oh, and some other courses as well, but yeah. So, you know, Always happy to chat. Right. Has anybody else got any last questions? I think we're probably, I've witted on in the words of um, true British phrase for far too long. Has anybody else got any questions? No? Okay. Well, thank you all for coming. I know for some of you, it's quite early in the morning. For some of you, it's lunchtime and some of you, it's somewhere in between. Uh, do please keep joining the uh, Marshall Hangouts. Um, we've got some good ones coming up. Uh, we have um, Lionel Foster, who is a 2001 scholar, who is going to talk about setting up philanthropy um, when, um, when you don't have a lot of money. And we also have Clara Shee, who is the CEO and founder of Hearsay, which is a Silicon Valley um, company, and she's going to talk about setting up your own company and being a CEO. We have Olka Joshi in two weeks time who will be talking about um, education policy. So, you know, do come along and join us. Um, and, you know, as I said, if any of you need to talk to us, ask us questions, just let us know. So thank you very much. We look forward to meeting you all, probably virtually in September. And I look forward to meeting you all in person in October, November and December. Hopefully we'll be able to gather you all together in one place because, you know, it is such a special thing. I hope that you're all excited about coming. I know it's a big unknown, um, but things are getting better here and I'm optimistic that, you know, the universities are really going to be looking after you and do a whole, whole load of stuff to make sure that you're all engaged. So thank you very much for coming and we'll see you soon. <laughs>